Hi everyone, this is Dr. Zapchinski. This presentation is about fluid restoration. In this presentation, we will review how fluid is distributed throughout the body, what it's made of, the intake and output, signs and symptoms of fluid deficit, how these symptoms develop, hemorrhage and its classifications, the body's response to fluid loss or hemorrhage, principles of fluid replacement, the types of fluid we use to replace fluid loss, and catheters and tubing used for rapid infusion. Water makes up about 60% of the body weight in an adult. In infants, that's about 75%. Water is contained in the intracellular and extracellular spaces. Two-thirds or 60% of water is in the intracellular space of the muscles and the organs. The remaining third is within the extracellular space, uh, the spaces outside of the cells. This, the interstitial fluid that is in the tissues and bathes the cells and the intravascular space or the blood vessels. Note that the smallest volume of water is actually in the blood vessels. Body water can move freely between the intra- and extracellular spaces through a semi-permeable membrane by osmosis. This is a review of the physiology here. Osmosis is the movement of water. I always remember it as H2O osmosis from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Water wants to dilute solute until there is equilibrium across the membrane. The major intracellular cation or positively charged is potassium. The major extracellular cation is sodium. Cations are usually joined to anions or negatively charged particles to form neutral molecules. Examples are bicarb, chloride, and phosphorus. Those are the major anions. And they form molecules such as sodium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium carbonate, and calcium chloride. Body water is gained through fluid intake, either by food or water. And there are expected losses every day through elimination of the kidneys and the bowel, through skin, sweat, and through vapor, uh, water vapor that escapes from our lungs when we exhale. Unexpected loss that leads to deficits of fluid include vomiting and diarrhea that result in the loss of fluid and electrolytes, trauma, which can result in the loss of volume, uh, burns that cause tissue damage, and sepsis. So signs and symptoms of fluid deficits. Small volume loss, first of all, can lead to thirst. So such as being out in the sun, working and sweating. 6% of loss of body water can cause a decrease in the skin turker. 8% can lead to orthostatic changes. These are some common things that occur in people that are working outside in the heat. They stand up suddenly and they get dizzy. And 10% can cause organ dysfunction. Think heart and kidneys, such as tachycardia, oliguria. Again, I always think of the hot day at Six Flags when it's 120 degrees on that asphalt sidewalk and people are dropping like flies and their heart rates are high. They're drink, they may be drinking those gallon drinks of uh, sodas and they're not peeing. How quickly symptoms of dehydration develop depends on how fast the fluid was lost. In gradual dehydration, this allows for a fluid shift so that the vascular space, the blood compartment, which is what gives us our uh, blood pressure, can refill with few symptoms. Rapid loss, such as hemorrhage, doesn't allow for timely shift of fluid, and so symptoms can occur very quickly.
Hemorrhage is classified in four different categories. The first, or class one, is a loss of blood less than 750 mils. Think about that. That's um, the equivalent of maybe one and a half units of, of packed cells. During this type of a hemorrhage, um, heart rate can be normal, blood pressure can be normal, but the pulse pressure may be a little, may be normal or a little high. Person may feel a little anxious because remember that when blood is lost, we also lose the oxygen that perfuses our tissues, especially our brain and our and our heart, and um, this can cause this anxiety. In a class two hemorrhage, up to 1500 mils is lost. The person may become tachycardic with a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute. The blood pressure may remain normal. The pulse pressure may be decreased and the respiratory rate may increase. Now, why does the blood pressure remain normal? Because tachycardia is a comp compensatory mechanism. The heart will beat faster to move blood around so that the blood pressure will remain normal, but this only lasts for a period of time. The heart is a muscle, and tachycardia is not sustainable over, a t over an extended period of time. The heart gets tired and the blood pressure will drop. In the later classes of hemorrhage, class three and class four, a good bit of blood and the oxygen contained in that blood is gone. The heart becomes tachycardic, the blood pressure decreases, the pulse pressure decreases, respiratory rate increases, people are anxious and confused, and they may be lethargic. The body's response to blood loss occurs in several phases. The first phase is a compensatory refilling of the vascular space. Now remember the vascular space and the interstitial space are extracellular. They contain the least amount of water in the body. But in this first phase, water will shift first from the interstitial space, the space between the tissues, into the vascular space this occurs because there is a decrease in volume in the vascular space, which creates an increase in, um, in concentration, solute concentration, if you will. And water will, through osmosis, shift over. There's also a change in the pressure, which also causes water to move. This can support up to a liter of blood loss and maintain the vital signs within a, some normal range. The refilling of the vascular space will continue for a while, up to 36 hours. Keep in mind that the shift to vascular space, the shift to the vascular space depletes the interstitial fluid space. Now, this mechanism works well for people who have no underlying health issues, but people with heart failure, malnourishment, or chronic illness may not be able to tolerate even small amounts of blood loss. They simply don't have the resources. The second phase is about pipes and fluid. Pipes being our blood vessels and fluid being um, blood and body water. The activation of the renin angiotensin system causes constriction of the blood vessels and retention of sodium by the kidneys. So two things are happening. One, we're making the pipes smaller. By making the pipes smaller, that will increase the blood pressure. Remember, the larger the, the pipe, the lower the pressure. So this is the opposite. So the tighter the pipe, the higher the pressure. Then the kidneys will also retain sodium in an effort to retain water. That will help to fill up the vascular space as well. In phase three, this happens um, over as another compensatory mechanism, and that's the stimulation of erythropoiesis from blood loss. Erythropoietin is actually um, made, by the, is made by the kidneys, and it stimulates the long bones of the body to birth red blood cells. 
when the RBCs, circulating RBCs drop to a certain point, erythropoiesis is, kicks in, and this is through a very complicated mechanism. New cell production can be anywhere from 15 to 50 mils of blood per day, which is not a great deal, but over a period of time it helps. But replacement of a significant loss of red blood cells takes months rather than days. In talking about how we replace fluid, the rule of thumb is replace what's been lost. If you've lost water and electrolytes, say through diarrhea or dehydration from heat uh, related problems, then you're going to replace water and electrolytes. If you lose blood, then you will replace blood with blood products and with volume expanders. There are a couple of types of fluids that we look at, and one is crystalloids and the other is colloids. Crystalloids are water-soluble mo molecules that include electrolytes, dextrose, lactate that's dissolved in water. Remember that water moves freely across all fluid spaces depending on the solute concentration. So if I use a um, a normal saline or a lactate, this will help move fluid into the interstitial space from the vascular space to help replenish loss in that space. Crystalloids are classified as hypotonic, isotonic, or hypertonic. This refers to the concentration of solutes within those fluids in relationship to a normal osmolality of our blood. The normal osmolarity of our blood is 280 to 300 milliosmoles per liter. Hypotonic means solutions that have less than that concentration. When you give a fluid such as D5 or half normal saline, then water can move freely from the vascular compartment into the interstitial and into the intracellular uh, compartments. It actually will rehydrate cells. Isotonic is a solution that is equal to a normal uh, serum concentration. It is used to expand the vascular space and replace electrolytes. Normal sol, isolite, D5W, um, normal saline and ringers are, and lactated ringers are uh, examples of that. Now, why is D5W in both hypotonic and isotonic? Because once the dextrose within that solution is absorbed and metabolized, then that no longer is isotonic. It actually becomes hypotonic or free water and will move. That's why it's in both of those um, settings. Now, it is important to know that for each liter of crystalloid you give, about 250 mils is going to stay in the intravascular space. The remaining solution is going to shift, and it shifts because of the difference in concentration across the membranes that, that invites water to move. It also um, changes according to the metabolism of whatever is within that solution, such as dextrose. Hypertonic is a solution that is higher than serum concentration, and that includes normal saline, which is actually about 340 to 350 um, milliosmoles. Another one is 3% saline, which is sometimes given when a person is hyponatremic, but not very often and very, very carefully. 3% is about the uh, concentration of seawater. This slide shows you the actual concentrations for each of the types of solutions we talked about.
The other type of fluid that we use are colloids. These are composed of large insoluble, that means not dissolvable molecules that are stayed suspended in fluid. These are made to remain in the vascular space and hold volume. Think of a sponge that holds the water in there. These are used for severe hemorrhage when perfusion is affected. Albumin is a great example. Um, Hespan, head of starch, fresh frozen plasma, uh, plasminates, dextrans, and blood, of course, is the um, probably the main colloid that we consider in hemorrhage. For active bleeding, you cannot beat whole blood. Fresh, not banked, is preferred. It contains stable and labile clotting factors, red cells and platelets, and replaces volume within the blood vessels and replaces oxygen carrying capacity, which is so important in hemorrhage. Things to remember about blood transfusions is that the decision to transfuse is based on physiologic needs and symptoms and not solely on the hemoglobin or the hematocrit. People that have coronary artery disease or other diseases that make them um, more susceptible to decompensating because of hemorrhage may be transfused uh, with a higher hematocrit. This slide summarizes the effect of each of these fluids on the blood volume. How much you give and how much stays within the vascular system. How do we give these IV fluids? Poisouis law is helpful. Poisouis law of IV fluids is a mechanical physics law. It's basically how fluid moves through a tube, and that is based on the thickness or viscosity of the fluid the pressure gradient across the fluid. In other words, the um, how much pressure the fluid has to push against to get where it's going, the length of the tubing and the diameter of the tubing. All right, so I think we know just from basic nursing that if I have a bigger tube, uh, the fluid will flow faster. If I have a tiny little tube, there's a lot of resistance there for, for a fluid, especially a thick fluid like blood, to get through. So the things to think about are, when, are the type of fluids you're going to give and how fast you have to give it. The types of fluid are given a centipois rating. So commonly infused IV solutions um, such as lactated ringers, saline, those have a CP or centipois of one. The higher end is albumin with a centipois of 40 and blood which is actually fairly low at three and a half to five and a half centipois.
So practical uses of the law for ideal rapid infusion. The maximum infusion rate is going to be determined by the size of your IV catheter, not the vein you've put it into. Using the largest diameter catheter and the shortest length of tubing is going to get the fluid into the person faster. Infuse the lowest possible viscosity fluid under the maximum possible pressure. So what I always think about is the uh, typical scene in, on TV where they're trying to force blood into a patient who's bleeding out and people are standing around squeezing the blood bags. Okay, so you have more than one IV site and the fluid is running through under pressure. It's important to know that a central vein is not going to guarantee faster flow rate for a given size catheter. Now, a central or a large femoral vein will let you put a larger catheter in place. But again, the size of the catheter is what's important. The other thing is that longer catheters have slower flow rates, so you want the shortest catheter that you can use. Another thing is that viscous fluids flow better when they're warmed. It changes the viscosity. Um, so this is why blood is typically brought to room temperature before it's infused. So one of the take home messages here is that um, when you have to infuse a very large volume quickly, use two large bore peripheral, peripheral catheters. If the person is coding, Make sure you insert them above the uh, diaphragm because the uh, peripheral, the far peripheral uh, in the legs and the uh, hands are not going to receive the blood flow from cardiac compressions. These are some guidelines for fluid choices and they are basically a repeat of what we've talked about, a summary. For dehydration, use balanced electrolyte solutions initially. You can use hypotonic crystalloids for replacement of intracellular water loss. This is why you see D5W used a lot. Normal saline is not normal. It's not isotonic, it's hypertonic. Large volume replacement uh, with saline can cause hypochloremic acidosis or expansion acidosis. In acute hemorrhages, uh, classes one and two, you can use a crystalloid. In three, you start with a colloid initially and then and supplement with crystalloids. Often you're going to need blood as indicated by the physiologic need. Okay. Are they perfusing? If not, they're going to need some blood to replace the oxygen. And four, blood is always going to be essential in a class four hemorrhage, along with colloids and followed by crystalloids. Once you get your colloids in there, then you can start replacing water because you have something that will hold it in the vascular space. A sepsis is a whole different ball of game. Uh, in septic syndromes, and they are syndromes because so many things happen in a septic patient. Um, we limit crystalloids to two liters. We do not want to cause any problems with overexpanding the volume. And um, so we use colloids after to for intravascular volume expansion. Uh, this again, colloids will hold fluid in the vascular space because those larger insoluble molecules act as sponges and we want to avoid excessive crystalloid infusions because we can actually cause organ edema such as pulmonary edema which leads to organ dysfunction. In summary, symptoms develop according to how fast fluid is lost rather than how much was lost. Replace what was lost. If they've lost fluid and electrolytes because of diarrhea and vomiting, that's what you replace. If they've lost blood, you replace it with um, 
with colloids and blood if necessary and move on from there. The first goal is to restore volume and tissue perfusion. If they're not perfusing, it doesn't matter how much you pump into them. They need oxygen for tissue perfusion. Replenish the interstitial space because the interstitial space is going to fill the um, intravascular space and will become depleted. Ensure adequate carrying capacity. Replenish intracellular space. Replace according to the rate of loss. In other words, the faster they lost it, the faster you replace it. And remember that pH affects electrolytes. Let's go back to this ensure adequate carrying capacity. What can the person tolerate? That's what you want to be sure of there. You don't want to overload somebody um, because then you'll do more harm than good. These are the few of the references that I used in um, updating this offering. And I hope that this was a good review and maybe some new information for you on dealing with um, people that need fluid resuscitation.